on the airwaves of Hope Radio and those who are following with us on the different media platforms. You are very much welcome for the first service at Lift Up Jesus. And it's an honor and a privilege to be standing before you this morning. I give glory, honor, and praise unto Jehovah God, the Most High, for the opportunity and the privilege he has given unto us this morning to share the word together. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I would like us to join our faith together to thank God this morning for what he has yet to share with us. I will begin us sharing from uh, Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis, the first chapter. We have a few minutes, but we are going to use them profitably as the Lord takes us through. Genesis, the first chapter in verse 26, the Bible tells us that then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Next verse is that so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So here, like we have, we know, in verse 27, we see God creating man, both male and female. Male and female created in Genesis 1.27 explains a fundamental principle for us. Because you see, when you read Genesis chapter 2, the Bible tells us about God now making man from the ground. And you see there's a difference between creation and formation. Formation follows after creation. You cannot form what you've not created. Hallelujah. In the order of the existence of things, things must firstly be created before they are formed. Any formation of anything in this life is patterned after its creation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the next verse, the Bible tells us that, oh, verse 28. Verse 28, the Bible says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. He can use to uh, say, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. But we see that in verse 28, the first thing, the first command, the first instruction after creating man, God tells man to be fruitful. And this morning I want to share with us about living a life of fruitfulness. It is important for us in life to understand that when we were created, in God's image. Because the Bible tells us, in fact, when you go ahead and read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I want to show you something as I come back to this very portion of scripture in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Ephesians 2, verse 10. The Bible says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, the new creation, the born again believer. Today, you are God's handwork. You are God's craft. And the Bible says you are his workmanship. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says for good works. Hallelujah. For good works, which God prepared beforehand before you came to the world. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. What I see from scripture is a predetermined, a predetermined life according to God's design and God's creation. He knew you, the Bible says, before you are formed in your mother's womb. And he says, he predetermined beforehand that you should walk in good works. Now, when we get back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. So the first blessing 
that comes as an instruction as well to man is to be fruitful. Challengingly, as simple as many times we've heard this, not quite many believers today are living a life of fruitfulness. As we are weighed against the scales of truth and the standard of God's judgment, which is truth, his word, you realize that in many instances, not many are living a life of fruitfulness. Because to live a life of fruitfulness requires your personal responsibility to understand that even though God has commanded me, instructed me to live a life of fruitfulness, but as well, I have a responsibility to see this come to fruition, to see this come to its perfection. I usually say, it's a truth established in the word that you have, for example, received eternal life. But for that life to be a reality, you must understand your part. You must understand your responsibility in agreement with truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, instructions are given. But to obey the instruction is another thing. We are instructed to be fruitful. I don't know in your own personal life, if you vet your life through the lenses of the word, how do you measure up with God's standard for fruitfulness? Like I say, instructions are very important. In the Bible, we see that some men lost thrones because they were not following instructions. If you read uh, 1 Samuel, the Bible tells us that Prophet Samuel tells this, th this king, and uh, as, as you read uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13, the Bible says, uh, when Samuel came and told Saul, he told Saul that you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment. You've not kept the instruction of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. You see that throughout scriptures, different kings could not follow instruction. And some lost their thrones. There are many things. <laughs> Why say this? There are many things in life that a believer may not see in this life just because of their negligence to this principle. We thank God that we have perfect examples as well throughout Scripture. Men and women who have gone ahead of us and who pattern their lives to the obedience of instruction. We serve a faithful God, but He means it when it comes to the kingdom business. When it comes to your spiritual life, He means it. You may make your jokes with your friends, but not with the kingdom life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, when Adam received this instruction, it was a sealed instruction that its effect was even passed on to even his descendants. When you read Genesis, uh, when you read Genesis chapter 9 in verse 1, after the flood, even the first thing God tells Noah was be fruitful and multiply because it is an integral part in God's nature to confer fruitfulness to his children regardless of the fall of man God remained faithful to this commanded blessing that even 
when Adam fell in the garden, he had a redemptive plan. He sent Jesus. And Jesus, the Bible tells us, he's crucified on the tree. His body is taken and buried in that sculpture in the garden. Man fell in the garden. Jesus is buried again in the garden so that he would restore us to that consciousness of God's provision concerning fruitfulness. What does it mean to be fruitful? To be fruitful, it means to increase. To be fruitful, it means to be productive. In whatever thing that you're doing, how productive are you? How are you growing? Because to be fruitful, it also means to grow. This is not about the many years I've spent in church. Yes, you have. Thank God that you come to lift up Jesus. But how are you growing in your personal relationship with the Lord? How are you growing in your prayer life? How are you growing in the understanding of the word of God? To be fruitful, it means to grow. To be fruitful, it means to increase. To be fruitful, it means to expand. To expand in the vision that you carry. And this increase must be accompanied with equal manifestation of the grace that will sustain you and preserve you even while you are growing. Because it's, it's possible to be doing something, but yet that thing cannot last. It's possible to start up something, but yet it is not going to last. So there is a, re there is a requirement to understand that when we are measuring fruitfulness, it carries a judgment of understanding the measure of that equal manifestation of grace that sustains and preserves you even when you're growing that very thing. That can touch our finances. It can touch how we are serving the Lord. It can touch how we are even relating with the Lord. Last year, you used to spend maybe one hour in the presence. This year, what is the story? I have had some Christians who used to who say, those days, we were on fire for Jesus. What happened today? Those, those days, before I had them, I had money. I would walk to church and I would be there on time. What happened? Sometimes we've built monuments that we look to and give us reference to having lived this Christian life. And God says, be fruitful. When you cease to bear fruit, you cease to live. There is no one, there is nothing in this life that will ever show an evidence of life without fruit. That's how important and integral this principle is for our lives. To be fruitful, it means to enlarge. Why do we need to be fruitful? We need to be fruit because bearing fruit brings glory to the Lord. The Father is glorified when you bear fruit. The Bible tells us in John chapter 15, if we could read verse 8, the Bible says that by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. A true mark, one of the true marks of the disciple of the Lord. If you are truly following God in 2024, you must purpose to bear much fruit. Not only, by the way, to bear fruit, but also to come to a level where your life is an expression of bearing much fruit. Praise the Lord. Am I communicating to somebody this morning? Many times we have justified, we have given reasons why we cannot do this, why this is not possible, why this is... Ah, it is time to arise to the challenge of life. Amen. 
Yes, I've been going to church. Yes, I've been attending this fellowship. I have been doing ABCD. But where is that fruit? Because you see, one of the other reasons why it is integral and important for our life to bear fruit, fruitfulness is a message that indeed God is faithful. Fruitfulness is a language. There are many people that may not listen to our words, but are the witness of the fruit of your life, they will believe your God. This may be in your family, it may be at your workplace, it may be anywhere that some men will still believe God because your life is an expression of fruitfulness. Jesus tells us a parable in Luke chapter 8. An amazing parable, he talks about the sower. In Luke chapter 8 from verse 1 to verse 15, I want to go through a few of these verses. And the Bible says, now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. Let's go on. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Mangadurin, out of whom had come seven demons, and Jonah, the wife of Chusa, Herodes' steward, and Suzanne, and many others who provided for him from their substance. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they were come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sold, some fell by the wayside. The parable begins to tell us a sower went. The Bible does not tell us who this sower was. But as you move to read, the Bible says that this sower went to sow seed. And when he was sowing seed, some fell by the wayside. And the Bible tells us the experience that happened after this seed fell by the wayside, the Bible says it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it. The Bible says some fell on the rock and as soon, you see, some fell on the wayside. Number one, some fell on the wayside. There is a wayside. In the next portion of scripture, some fell on the rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. In the next verse, the Bible says that some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others, <laughs> there is always that. The Bible says, but others fell on the good ground. Somebody tell your neighbor the good ground. Hallelujah. Some fell on the good ground. And the Bible says that 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 fell on the good ground sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried. And he says, he who has ears to hear, let him do what? Now, on that verse, he who has the ears, let him hear. When the Bible uses hearing the second time, that is understanding. So it seeks your understanding. Now, in the next verse, then the disciples asked him, what does this parable mean? Listen to his answer. He says, and he said to you, he said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. It is given to the children of God to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest, it's given in parables. That seeing, they may not see. And hearing, they may not do what? Understand. Now, the next portion of scripture. Now, the parable is what? The seed is not a business idea. The seed is not the job you're believing God for. The seed is not the scholarship you're believing God for. The seed is 
the word of God. As important every other thing may be in your life. But the parable is that the seed is the word of God. And as we continue to read in the next verse, the Bible says that those, now he begins to interpret and explain to us the experiences that this soul went through. He tells us that the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their what? Oh, I thought the wayside was something else. But he now tells us, when he's talking about the wayside, he's talking about the rock, he's talking about the good ground, that is the state of the heart. Hallelujah. In the parable, we see that as the sower went sowing, the seed which is the word of God falls in different states of hearts. And the first state here, which is the wayside, the Bible teaches us something important, that the word comes to them, then the devil does what? How does the word settle? And the devil comes and takes away. You're not concerned, and the devil just takes the word away. This shows a lot of care, carelessness, right? Do we agree? Such a person was living a life of carelessness. That he was not so, how can someone enter your house and they take everything and you are there and you're not concerned, you're not moved. But it happened. This is the state of the heart. And the Bible says, the devil takes the word out of their hearts. Why? Lest they should do what? Believe and be saved. The next portion of scripture tells us, but the ones on the rock are those who hear. When they hear, they're excited. They will lift the chairs. They will scream. They will shout. They will do everything in the house of the Lord. They will talk about this word. Oh, the word was powerful. Oh, the word was so impactful. But what happens? The Bible tells us they, these have no what? Have no loot. They believe for a while. And in the time of temptation, they fall away. In the time when they are needed to bring forth, they can't bring forth. The next. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they heard, they go out once they leave that door, they are what? Choked with cares. They left church and all of a sudden, the challenges of life place them so low to conform to the standards of the world. Cares, riches, pressures of life. They never bring fruit to maturity. Hallelujah. But as you read this parable, you realize that the sower was so patient. Why do I say this? Because he went sowing. He didn't sow at the same time. The first instance, seed falls on one kind. But he goes ahead. He does not give up. He sows seed again. He does not give up. He sows seed again. But as you continue to read, the Bible tells us there are those that fell on the good ground. And these are those having heard the word with a noble and good heart. <laughs> Say good heart. Good heart. It's important that you have a good heart. Hallelujah. Because with that good heart, the Bible says they keep it and do what? Bear fruit with patience. They bear fruit with patience. They bear fruit with patience. Testations may come.
Trials may come. Difficult times may come. But as you bear fruit, it is required of you that it becomes integral. That patience must be a great strength that you lay a hold to. Amen. Be patient in everything. Don't give up. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 that we are not of them that draw back to perdition, but we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. It is never over until God says so. Hallelujah. The devil may attack. The devil may disorganize you. The devil may do anything but stand to the ground immovable in your faith knowing that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Carry this affirmation, carry this truth that he who began a good work in you will take it to accomplishment that no devil from hell will ever disorganize or should suck it God's plan in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Irrespective of how turbulent any storm can be. Remain focused to this word. Hallelujah. When you read John chapter 15 from the first verse as we are drawing to, to, to close I'll end with this portion of scripture just because of time. In John chapter 15 verse 1, the Bible says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That it should do what? It should bear more fruit. That it should bear more fruit. Every branch in me. The Bible, in the first verse, let me show you something. He says, I am the true vine. This is in reference to Jesus Christ. Are we together? And he says that my father is the vine dresser. Hallelujah. The next verse, he says, every branch in me, when you receive Christ, you become a fruit-bearing branch. Hallelujah. Raise your right hand and say, I am a fruit-bearing branch. If you believe, say amen. And the Bible says that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he does what? He prunes. The Greek word for pruning is kathairo. And kathairo means to consecrate. He cons one of the meanings, it means to consecrate. It means that every branch that bears fruit, he does what? He consecrates it. That it should do what? That it should bear more fruit. And this teaches us that one of the key things that make your life to bring forth much fruit is consecration. There must be consecration of your heart. If you are going to bear much fruit, you must, your heart must be available for God to be dealt with. There are things that you must suffer loss for. Like Paul said, I, all that I counted, oh my God. He said, I have, I have counted it what? I have considered it all what? Dung. That I may do what? That I may do what? Children of God. Let's go there. <laughs> Many people, they stay connected to things that must live. Sometimes a pruning comes and it's as though you think you're being punished. But yet, this is the doing of the Lord. Because whosoever God loves, he chastises. Whosoever God loves, and that's the vision you carry with God. To understand because you see, when he prunes, like I've said, primarily, he prunes your, your spirit. He prunes your heart. He consecrates your heart. 
That's the first thing God consecrates. When we are understanding consecrations of our life, the first thing that God consecrates is our heart. And there are three most important things that must undergo consecration. Number one, your heart. The consecration of your heart. Number two, the consecration of your mind. Two things are important. Because anything that you receive with your hands, but without your heart and your mind involved in it, it is not yours. So it is important for God to firstly consecrate your heart because the heart determines how far you can go in this life. The Bible says, guard your heart because out of it flows the issues of life. Out of it are the boundaries of life, meaning that the state of your heart determines how far you can go in this life. It determines how you can be fruitful in this life. It matters. It's very important about the state of your heart. The state of the heart is something so powerful. Like I said, the consecration primarily is of your heart. Number two, your mind. Number three, most importantly, your lips. The mouth must be consecrated. Some people have understood or have grown in maturity to understand how to guard their heart, how to renew their mind, but the lips are not consecrated. They can say anything. They can say, they can speak anyhow. Even before uh, their employers, they don't have any humility in them to know that I'm even standing before greatness and I need to tame my tongue. Some people have lost their jobs because of how they responded to their superiors. Some people have lost their opportunities. Some people, doors have been closed over their lives just because they lost their cool on the tongue. And they said what they should not have said. If you are going to bring glory to the Lord, the heart must be consecrated. I just feel in my heart that we are living in days where our hearts, our minds, and our tongue must be consecrated. If you are going to see the revival that has been prophesied, that has been spoken to us, if you are going to manifest and walk in the increased dimensions of God's glory, if you are going to touch and change lives, our heart must be consecrated. It's a, it's a great calling that our hearts must be consecrated. It's you must leave what ought to be left. Even in prayer, some people still carry stuff in their heart. They, they have grudges with every other person and they are praying to a God who loves those people. But you want God to answer you. You want to bear fruit in your prayer life. But yet, you carry unforgiveness. You carry bitterness. You carry anger in your heart. You carry envy in your heart. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that let us lay aside every encumbrance, every weight of sin. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run this race. Let us live this life of fruitfulness. With what? Patience. With endurance. That is set before us. This year, purpose not to carry forward any lot and tomatoes. Any. You see, there, there, there are friendships that must not stay. If you are serious with your life. I have seen that even in some times. Some people must live your life. For you to hear God. Clearly. You may not hear God when you are still with some kind of people. In quotes. And sometimes you find someone. Staying along. And pursuing this person who ought to leave them. They don't know God is pruning. God is doing some cathyro. And they don't understand this. That it is for their benefit to bear much fruit. 
and you keep a hold and by this you limit the expression of that provision by God for you to bear much fruit this year it's my prayer that as we seek God as we look to Jesus that our hearts will be consecrated enough there are also levels in consecration but at least let it find expression in your life the consecration of the heart the consecration of the mind the consecration of your lips it's just only because of time there's quite a lot that we could share on this but one important thing that I can leave with you as we are reading in John chapter 15 when you read verse 7 the Bible says if you abide in me and my words abide in you you shall ask what you will and it shall be done the Greek word for abide is meno and it means to stay present not staying present to TikTok not staying present to YouTube not staying present to every social media platform that you know but to stay present and to him not ma not many believers today can stay present to the Lord there's a lot of distraction around believers today that they are so distracted from the presence of the Lord they have all the excuses why they can't settle why they can't sit in church to listen to the word but if you called them for some money in town they would rush and be available if you called them for something that is tangible they will hasten to be there but when it comes to staying in the presence let it be prayer let it be reading and studying the word that is not something that is appeasing to them it's not something that is enjoyable and by this their spirit man does not see God as they ought to the vision is tainted because you see when you stay present to the Lord he prunes you he consecrates and when he consecrates primarily is for you to see him as he wants you to see him not how you are taught not how you've known him before but how he wants you him how he wants you to see him because how you see God is very important in establishing your relationship with him you can relate to God to the degree of your vision in him or to the degree of your vision concerning him inconsistence in staying present is the reason it is the consequence it is the outcome that you see as people not seeing a certain consistency with their life as being fruitful because you'll see inconsistency in bearing fruit today you're shining the other day you're not shining today you're up the other day you're down why because there is a gap many are inconsistent in their pursuit with God many are inconsistent we have all the frenzy excuses why we can't be in the presence we are living in amazing days where if you're serious to stand you must strengthen your faith by staying present to the Lord and to be to be present to the Lord is to be absent from the world you cannot stay present to the Lord if you're still present to the world you cannot the things you must let go the things you must lay aside hallelujah let's worship the Lord just take this moment with the Lord as we worship you could kindly stand on your feet
take this moment personal with the Lord. I don't know what you do. I don't know your experience. I don't know the state of your heart. But mean it. Mean business with God. If there be things that must live, let them live. If God has to shake what he must shake, let him shake it. If it's the grace to last, cry out to God for that grace. Many can start, but not all finish and finish well. It takes grace from above. It takes grace from God to finish stronger and to finish well. We are living in days when it has been said there is a great falling away. But may God supply grace this morning unto you that it will not be said of you that you once lived so powerful, you once lived so fervent unto the Lord and now your hearts have grown so cold. Let God redefine your pursuit. Lord God, we pray by your word you will prefer the motives of our hearts. Help us to redefine what must be redefined. Help us to see what we must see. There is more. There is more. There is more. There is more, is more. Is more in God. There is more in God. The things we counted of good today, we know they cannot be compared with the glory to come. Position us to see the way we must see, Lord. Position us, align us with the synchronicities of the spirit realm. Manta Kabaladaba, Santa Kalibaya, Manta Kalabaye, Manta Kalabaye, Sharababa Yerebo, Araba Yerekata, Asanta Kaliba, and Tekelelelo, Santa Kalabaye, things touching destinies, things touching nations. My God, my God, Sharaba Katayalapa, Shetekelelebosa, Epeketelepa, Katalabaye. Help us to incline our minds. Help us to incline our hearts to you, Lord. To your vision, to your word, to your instruction. Grant us grace.
of obedience to the things you say, to the things you say, to the things you reveal. May we be obedient. The Bible says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land in the land of the living. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, you cannot live a life of fruitfulness without the word. The Bible has told us that the seed is the word. The parable is that the seed is the word of God. Fruitfulness only begins when the word of God settles in your heart. And the Bible says that in the beginning was the word. This seed is the word of God. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, just raise your hand wherever you are, whether you're listening to us, whether you're listening to us through the airwaves of Hope Radio, or you're following with us. At this moment, you can make your greatest decision to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Wherever you are, just raise your hand and we pray with you. You want to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you are here with us today and it's you I'm talking to, just raise your hand. You have nothing to be afraid of. This is the greatest decision that you can make to receive him. If you are here, you've never confessed with your mouth that Jesus died for your salvation and he rose again. The Lord is speaking to you. Want to receive Jesus? Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Let us pray with you. Let us pray with those that are following with us and listening to us. If you're receiving Christ right now, just repeat these words and mean them from the bottom of your heart. Say, Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I've heard your word and I've believed in my heart. Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe that you raised him from the dead for my glory. I boldly and openly confess that from this day, Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. I receive you, Lord Jesus, into my life. And from today, I'm born again. I'm a son of God. Amen. Those who prayed that prayer, wherever you are listening from and following through the different platforms, just go ahead and share your testimony of salvation with any pastor in your neighborhood. But if you can make your way to lift up Jesus, we shall continue to help you to grow in the Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's one more last thing to do. Can we, can we welcome Pastor Matthias? <laughs>